Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Monday morning session. Uh, this morning, we're going to kick off with two named lectures, followed by a panel session, followed by our third named lecture. The uh, first lecture of the day will be delivered by Dr. Gilbert Upchurch from the University of Florida. This is the state of the art lecture where we invite a nationally round, renowned expert in a given field to share their perspective on either that field of surgery or surgery in general. Gilbert Upchurch is the Edward Copeland and Anna and Ira Horowitz chair of the University of Florida Department of Surgery. He joined the University of Florida in 2017 with an international reputation as an acclaimed clinician, researcher, and educator in the study and treatment of vascular disease, especially disease of the aorta. And in addition to his role as chair, he serves on the Shands Hospital Board and is president of the faculty group practice plan. Gibb earned his medical degree at UNC Chapel Hill. He trained then at the, the Brigham in Boston, as well as the Cleveland Clinic. Before he joined the University of Florida, he served as Chief of Vascular and Endovascular Surgery in the Department of Surgery at UVA and spent 11 years at the University of Michigan as well. He is an exemplary teacher and mentor, having received multiple teaching awards over the course of his illustrious career. As a clinician scientist, currently he holds four NIH R01 grants devoted to the study of aortic aneurysms and dissections. He has served as a permanent member of the BTSS at the NIH, given over 425 invited and extramural lectures, while in the meantime publishing a mere 415 papers in refereed journals and a measly 95 book chapters. Dr. Upchurch is a fellow of the American College of Surgeons, the American Heart Association, and the SVS. In addition to this ver his various medical association memberships, Dr. Upchurch is past president of the Virginia Vascular Society, the Society for Clinical Vascular Surgery, and the Southern Association for Vascular Surgery. He recently served as chair of the Vascular Surgery Board, as well as chair of the nominating committee of the American Board of Surgery, and was recently elected to the highly prestigious National Academy of Medicine. On a personal note, Gibb is one of the nicest guys you're going to meet. He's a fantastic friend and mentor, and I'm thrilled to death to have him deliver our state-of-the-art lecture. Join me in welcoming Dr. Gibb Upchurch to the podium. Well, good morning. I hope they're handing out coats as you come in. Um, it is a little bit like the frozen tundra here. I want to thank Brian and the program committee for actually inviting me to give this lecture. Um, this uh, Southeastern Surgical Congress has meant a lot to the University of Florida. I know a number of past presidents, in particular Dr. Copeland, who always speaks so amazingly highly of this uh, group of people, and I've enjoyed the fellowship and the amazing lectures and the presentations. <clears throat> Today, I really wanted to talk to you. This is a state-of-the-art lecture, and while I love to talk about thoracoabdominal aneurysms more than I uh, more than sleeping, obviously. Um, uh, I thought it would be best if I talk about the state of surgery. Uh, as surgery is an art, I thought that would be okay, and you'd probably probably enjoy that a little bit more than hearing about complex thoracoabdominal aneurysm repairs. This is my wife, Nancy, who's a voluminous reader of books, you know, those things that you used to carry around with pages and you'd, you know, you'd sort of uh, read them every now and then. After almost 30 years of marriage, it dawned on me that we'd really never shared books. Therefore, we decided to try and enrich our marriage by exchanging books. I asked her to pick out five books that she enjoy and share with them with me so we'd have those in common. Incidentally, when I asked my wife to read this, she said, you'd make me sound like a total downer. And in fact, she's actually the most positive person I've ever met, and my kids are a direct reflection of her. But the important thing about these five books was they all challenged me to find joy in what I would consider non-standard communities. It was not lost on me that at least two of the five books were about grumpy old men. I'm pretty sure she was trying to tell me something. In A Man Called Ove, Ove, the town grump, after losing his wife, is subjected to a family that moves in and, is, and breaks all the rules of the housing project they live in. While Ove himself is a strict rule follower, ultimately he is taken in by the, quote, foreigners from across the street and learns to love the rule breakers. 
In the story of Arthur True Love, the old man Arthur meets a young girl named Maddie in a cemetery when he's visiting his late wife's graves. They befriend each other and ultimately form a non-traditional family. All of these books confirm that your community or your family is not just who you're related to, but your family can also be those with whom you work, your partners, your lab or operating room techs, your fellows and residents. They are your community. All these books have at the core the interdependence of friends and coworkers, even people who you may not typically engage with, providing support and love to those experiencing grief. Since the pandemic, I've heard many healthcare providers, including surgeons, nurses, staff members, and trainees, describe the emotional impacts of COVID as a period of loneliness and depression. This is a scene, remember when we didn't have the vaccine, we didn't even hardly know how the virus was transmitted. Imagine how alone a dying COVID patient felt when isolated from loved ones for fear of viral transmission. The aforementioned books all have protagonists who find themselves alone, but ultimately find love, friendship, and meaning from the unexpected, being forced to find strength through a connection with others. As surgeons, we dedicate ourselves to doing for others, sometimes against incredible odds. In this picture on your right is John is Rooster Cogburn, played by John Wayne, and then the four outlaws on the left. This is a scene from True Grit. What about this reminds you of surgery? And this, these four bad, these four outlaws really could be aneurysms, pancreatic cancer, a bad trauma, a pediatric patient with a congenital diaphragmatic uh, hernia, armed with some sc a scalpel, some wire, some grafts or stents. We take on some of the most complex pathologies in all of human disease. For this privilege, we should be thankful for our ability to help others through surgery. I love this quote by E.B. E. B. White when I think about the joy of surgery. By helping you, by helping others, perhaps I was trying to lift myself up a trifle. At the beginning of the COVID pandemic, I discovered renewed joy in getting back to the operating room. While I had really large practices at the University of Michigan as well as the University of Virginia, my job at care actually takes responsibilities intermittently. However, during the early COVID pandemic, with restrictions on travel and in-person meetings, I was confined to Gainesville and was better able to support the vascular surgery team. While some might find it hard to call a period 23 years later of career affirmation, I was reminded that, that I love being in the operating room, where the team takes on the responsibility of making someone who trusts you to make them better. While I remain convinced out, more surgeons lead to, need to lead healthcare systems outside of the operating room. This was a welcome reminder to myself that I love to be in the operating room. Of all my jobs, being a surgeon is my true north. At present, with all the nursing shortages, people leaving healthcare in droves, it might feel to some in the audience, as the columnist David Brooks suggests, our society has become a conspiracy against joy. In fact, it's easy to think of joy as something that follows success or something you feel when things are going well, when in fact, the opposite is true. Having joy actually leads to success. Longitudinal studies of hospital employees, automobile manufacturer workers, college students, and yes, even Catholic nuns have concluded that joy is better that joy is associated with better performance reviews, higher pay, and greater long-term health. It is theorized that this that joy makes us more creative, intellectual, social, and collaborative. As a surgeon scientist, I had to go find some science behind this. And germane to the pandemic, joy might actually boost your immune system. A group of scientists, as shown here, administered a survey to assess emotional states among 334 healthy volunteers who were administered the rhinovirus, the virus that causes the common cold. They were given nasal drops and then quarantined. After controlling for virus-specific antibody levels, 
prior to inoculation and demographic factors, they're actually, if you can see in this upper right-hand uh, corner, there's actually a dose-dependent response between a positive emotional style or joy and symptoms of having a cold. This suggests that joy even fights the common cold. So where did you find joy during the pandemic? Many of my cohorting young faculty as shown in these pictures found joy in actually getting their past academic work do, done. Others with school age kids uh, found joy spending more time with their children and learning of course that their kids are by far smarter than their parents at a similar age. I love this picture in the middle actually um, Samir Shaw with his son sitting in his lap, he actually claims that he was writing what turned out to be a successful K-23 grant during the COVID pandemic. We learned to Zoom with family members who are remote. These are my parents and my three uh, elderly kids and dogs. Wouldn't it be nice if the new normal involved more regular FaceTiming or Zooming with your elderly parents? I found, as I discussed earlier, renewed joy in hanging out with my grown sons and being a surgeon. I was reminded that helping others through performing surgery gives real purpose to our lives. Sometime, however, during the last three years, and as we began to emerge from COVID, we concurrently found ourselves beginning to question, how did the world become so polarized around seemingly everything? Will we ever emerge from this tailspin? Using my own life as a metaphor, I realize that often it is the struggle in which we grow the most and that the path is far from linear. During those three years, I began to start reading more, more deeply about some of the issues that were affecting us. In his book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community, Dr. King stated that the line of progress is never straight. For a period, movement they follow a straight line and then it encounters obstacles and the path actually bends. Failing to understand this as a normal process or development may lead some to experience unjustified pessimism and despair. Focusing on the ultimate goal and discovering it's still distant, we may declare that no progress has been made at all. However, to dismiss a series of small successes because it does not usher in a panacea to our problems is to fail to comprehend to comprehend the process of achieving victory. We as a surgery community need to recognize that small victories are, st are still victories. And rather than reading off a list of what might be wrong with surgery and in healthcare, I thought it might be better for me to suggest that we only will be our very best specialty when we recognize that the quote, ultimate solution lies in our willingness to obey the unenforceable for me, that is simply to always do the right thing, even if it's the only truth that you know for the patient. As part of my own personal journey to understand why we might be feeling so polarized, I turned once again to the New York Times bestseller, David Brooks, in his book entitled The Second Mountain, The Quest for a Moral Life. Mr. Brooks describes the first mountain, happiness, as one that we should all, we should all aspire to, and importantly, moving from the second mountain to the to, from the first mountain to the, to the second mountain doesn't mean rejecting the things that are important in the first mountain. Brooks suggests that when society is built around self preoccupation, its members become separated from one another, divided and alienated, as many of us felt coming out of the COVID pandemic. It seems presently that the world is built more around self preoccupation leading to a loss of connect connectivity, solidarity, and less of a focus on the common good. It's in moving past from the first mountain to the second mountain that we find joy in community. On the second mountain, one commits to four things, a vocation, a spouse or a family, a philosophy or a faith, and then community. Brooks defines commitment as, uh, the, as making a promise to something without an expected reward, or even expecting the work you set out to do will be committed, completed during your lifetime. The definition builds on the approach I spoke of earlier of doing the right thing, even when it is unenforceable. Brooks suggests that we move from a tribe to a community mentality where tribe is defined as a group banded 
together against a common enemy. For a vascular surgeon, that's easy. It's a cardiologist. For many of you in the room, that might be your, your administrators. While a community is a group that cares about the well-being of each other. Our only way to get to the second mount, mountain as a specialty is to recenter, refocus, and continue to build a culture that steers people towards relation and community. We as a surgical community need renewal. It is about finding an ethos similar to when we all first became doctors that puts commitment to the patient at the center of what we do. We should be raging against surgical pathology together as a community. After almost three years of being paralyzed by this pandemic, as suggested some 50 years ago, we need to realize that for the first time, there is no deficit in human resources, only a deficit in human will. It's amazing to actually think about it, that we could actually, we have the wealth today to actually end world hunger. To help us find joy and be a better community, I have three suggestions to the Southeastern Surgical Congress. First, be thankful. Acknowledging that good you already have in your life is the foundation for all abundance. Abundance. During the pandemic, I suggested to you that I found joy in the opportunity to care for others. As surgeons, you are all real life heroes who are leaders of amazing teams. By continuing to help others, you're actively defeating your own sense of grief. You are moving from the first to the second time to the second mountain every time you're kind to an undergraduate or a medical student, every time you perform a limb or a life-saving a life -saving operation, every time you, po you, you praise a postdoctoral fellow who's made a new discovery. Express gratitude, recognizing that as we give to the surgery community in pennies, we receive back in dollars. My second suggestion is I wanna introduce you to a new term, joy value units. This occurs when you go from making something of your day to actually enjoying your day. Here, our residents are out ax throwing as part of a wellness event. I know that's probably not available in many of your hometowns, but uh, I actually just went ax throwing last uh, Saturday night. As the pandemic uh, passes and as we uh, reemerge, uh, it's important that everyone at least voluntarily reflect on some of the amazing and joyful things that are going on right now in surgery. In order for you individually and the surgery community as a whole to be our best, we need to continue to increase our joy value units as much as we increase our relative value units. Finally, recognize that you're never alone and it's okay to ask for help as you're part of a vibrant and amazing community not tribe. This includes both operative help as well as asking for help when your mental health needs are impacted. Whether it be secondary to the, to the uh, pandemic or entirely situational, we in healthcare are subjected to incredible stressors that sometimes we don't even recognize. It's important to recognize that you're never alone and it's okay to ask for help. So I have three suggestions for us in surgery in seeking joy and community. First, be thankful. Second, seek joy value units as much as you do relative value units. And number three, recognize you are never alone and it's okay to ask for help. As we emerge from the pandemic, let me suggest that you reconnect with a good book. Call a friend you haven't spoken to in a while. Visit a relative you haven't seen in a couple of years. Take up a new hobby. Go volunteer at a homeless shelter. For me personally, something as simple as finding a book that has heroes just like you, where a normal person overcomes incredible odds to make the world a better place by finding joy and community is a great place to start. And I'll, I'll tell you, um, I gave this as this, this talk is sort of a practice talk to my department. It's a little bit edited and hopefully a little bit more refined. But at the end of that, one of the most moving things happened. I had one of the chief residents come up to me and say, I wanna share something with you. He goes, as my mom was dying and in hospice, 
she shared something with me and I thought I would like to share it with you. And he sent me the, he sent me this slide and I thought I would share it with the Southeastern Surgical Congress. And it was this, I slept and dreamt that life was joy. I awoke and saw that life was service. I acted and behold, service was joy. It's really been an honor and a privilege to actually be with you here today. I really have enjoyed my time. And I once again want to thank Dr. Richmond and uh, the program committee for the honor of the podium. Thank you very much. So Gib, on behalf of the Southeastern Surgical Congress and appreciation of giving that fantastic state-of-the-art lecture, I'd like to give you this commemorative crystal and thank you for your participation. We hope to see you back again, my friend. Thank you. It's tough actually, by the way, to precede Joe Sacron. I, <laughs> I was gonna push. No.